العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds and peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad the master of the first and the last and upon his family and his companions and all those who call to his way and, and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, our friends, our viewers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, our praises to Allah. We have another opportunity to reflect upon a type of illumination that came over 1400 years ago. And that is not the light of electricity but it is the light of faith, the light of taqwa, the consciousness of God, the light of good character that manifested itself within a society that was known for its savagery. And that was in the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the last of a long series of prophets and messengers who came to every nation and every tribe. And one of the differences between Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the other great messengers was that he was sent to all of humanity. So his message, although the Quran came in a divine form of Arabic, it is situated and designed in such a way that people of all nationalities, all languages can benefit from the book, can benefit from the experiences that happened over the 23 year period to the day of judgment. And so within that generation that the Prophet ﷺ said, it is the best generation. They are the best of people. We get clues, we get direction, we get light as to how to function in different circumstances. And because the Sahaba, the companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, were from different walks of life, different tribes, nationalities, races, then we can see how people react to the circumstances. And these circumstances over the 23 year period give us an array uh, of situations and how to respond as a Muslim. And one of the great examples, which is of benefit and light to us in the 21st century now, when we find that Muslims are being surrounded, we find that Muslims are under attack in many parts of the world. And I'm not just talking about the wars that are going on in the Muslim world, but even in the Western countries where we are living for the most part as tax paying citizens, we have less amount of alcoholism illegal drug usage, stealing, murder, than any other part of the population. But yet because of our belief in Allah, because we believe that the creator of the heavens and the earth gave us a message that should impact all of our life, because of this, we are being persecuted. And so we look to the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, for the guidance that Allah manifested through their lives. One such person was the chief of the Banu Hanifa. And the Banu Hanifa was one of the large tribes in Al Yamama, which is the Nejd, Central Arabian area. And this area, up until now, is known for its huge valley uh, with water and with vegetation. So contrary to what you would think, the center of Arabia is not necessarily a, a major desert. It is more out toward the southeast side in the empty quarter. But the central part where the valley is has always been one of the most productive areas in the Arabian Peninsula. And so in the sixth year after the Hijrah, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent eight letters to the kings of Arabia. And these letters were to the major tribal groupings. Now we know many of these areas uh, as, as Yemen and we, we speak about Bahrain. 
and we look at different sections in Arabia, but in those days, <clears throat> they were tribal divisions. And so one of the great tribes or nations was the Benu Hanifa. And so a letter was sent to Tumama ibn Uthal, and he was a person known for his uh, emotion, known for his decisive actions. And when he received this le letter from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he flew into a rage. And he wanted to destroy this message and to destroy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself. This is the level of his arrogance uh, and the level of the authority that he thought he had in Arabia. And so he made his plans for the assassination of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed the Ummah by that time. And the Prophet was well secured uh, within the area of al Madinah to Manawara. And so Dumama was not able to carry out his wicked plan. And in the tradition of the pagans, the mushrikeen of the Arabian Peninsula, he planned to go to Mecca to make a type of Umrah, to make a lesser pilgrimage for the idols. And they used to go to Mecca in order to worship their idols and to pay obeisance, and also to discuss trade, to listen to poetry. This was their way of connecting with the other tribes uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. And so Tumama made his intention uh, to go. He wasn't able to fulfill his evil design, but he did find a group of Muslims who were passing through the area and he killed all of them. And so because of this, Dumama then became known as a person who was wanted. And the Prophet ﷺ actually put out a message against Dumama because of this murder that he had committed uh, on the companions. And Dumama then, in his arrogance, set out. And in order to get to Mecca coming out of this valley, you have to sort of pass within the vicinity of Medina uh, and then go down. This is the best way to avoid some of the worst part of the desert. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Dumama ran into a group of the Muslims who were scouting in that area and they succeeded in capturing him. And so this was a man who was, as they would say in Texas, in the USA, wanted dead or alive. They captured Thumama and they brought him back to Medina and they tied him to a pole in the, in the main masjid area. Because remember, the masjid was not just a place of prayer. The masjid was an all-purpose Islamic center. And so even in this case, with a person who is newly captured or for those who are embracing Islam, they would first bring them to the masjid. It's the main center of activity. Uh, within the city of Medina. They tied him to a pole and when they didn't know who they had, but when the Prophet Sallallahu saw this man, he realized this is Tumama. This is one of the great kings of the Arabian Peninsula. And it is the one who carried out attacks against our people. But instead of being revengeful and spiteful, the Prophet Sallallahu then said to his companions, take some milk from my camels, give him food, allow him to rest, keep him tied, but feed him. And so Tumama then was fed, he was watered, and he was able to take um, advice, or at least to see what was going on in the mosque, because this is a masjid which has a lot of activities. Time for prayer, people are making their salah. People are studying in halakas. The poor are being fed. Ta'alim is going on, education is going on. There's a brotherhood, there's a sisterhood too because sisters, women were also coming to the masjid. There was a section for the men and a section for the women. And this is something that was unheard of in other parts of Arabia, but women were liberated and they were coming to the masjid. And so Tumama, First day, he is uh, watching the activities that are going on in the masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ then came to Tumama 
and then uh, started to negotiate with him. And Tumama being an arrogant person, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu if you want to take revenge, then you have noble blood. If you want to forgive me, then I will be thankful. And if you want compensation, I'll give you anything that you want. So this is a tough negotiator. The Prophet Sallallahu then just watched him, just smiled and he left. Second day, the same thing happened. The third day, the same negotiation went about. Finally, after this, the Prophet Sallallahu again, who does not think like normal people, he is guided by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, not guided by his emotions. Naturally, one of the primal emotions amongst human beings is intiqam, that is revenge. And so instead of taking revenge, he is looking for this person to come into Islam, that the person has strong qualities and maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would guide uh, this person and help him to accept Islam. So the Prophet sallallahu in his mercy, and he was rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy to all of humanity, he said to his companions, release this man. And so they released him. And Tumama then went with his camel, he went to the outskirts of the city at that time, Al-Baqiya, the graveyard, uh, which is now sort of enclosed in Medina. But in those days, you had to go some distance from the Prophet's mosque to come to the graveyard. It was kind of an outskirts in that section. And he went there and he relaxed and he thought about what was happening. And Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up his heart. He realized something was coming over him. And he, he, he wanted more of this. Even though he had been hostile to Islam, he wanted more of this religion. And so he returned to the masjid. And he went in front of a group of the companions and he raised his hand and he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. He bore witness in the oneness of God and that Muhammad was his messenger. This was an amazing thing. The companions were shocked to see this. And when Dumama went into the person, or into the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu he exclaimed that you, O Muhammad, you were the most hated face, the hate, most hated personality in my life. But now you are the most dear person to me in this world. And the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, then prayed to Allah for blessing for Tumama. And Tumama then, feeling guilty for what had happened, he said, but I have killed people. I have done wrong. How can I atone for my sins? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, Al-Islam, yajubbu ma qabla. That Islam wipes away the previous sins. And so a great burden was lifted off the back of Tumama. And he let the Prophet, peace be upon him, know that his original intention was to go to Mecca to perform his jahili umrah, his visit to Mecca to worship idols. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, continue your intention, but do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Tumama then went down from Medina to Mecca, came into the precincts of the Kaaba. And as he came in, and he had been instructed by the Prophet, peace be upon him, how to make the basic umrah, what are the basic rites that you have to actually do. And as he was coming in, the Quraysh heard the sound, la baik Allahumma la baik, la baik la sharika laka la baik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. They heard that eternal sound, la baik Allahumma la baik, oh Allah, I am at your service. I'm at your service. There is no God except you. Surely the praise and the kingdom belongs to you. 
there is nothing worthy of worship except you. When the Quraysh heard this, they pounced upon this man. And one of their archers was about to shoot him and kill him. But the Quraysh then recognizing who it was, they said, don't do this. This is Tumama. He is the, the leader of Benu Hanifa. This is one of the most powerful clans in the Arabian Peninsula. We have to talk to this man. And so they, they went to Tumama, what are you doing? Are you disrespecting your parents and, and your religion? And Tumama then told them, I have accepted the best religion. And I came here in order to carry out my religion. The Quraysh then were dumbfounded. They didn't know what to do. Not just because this is a man who's accepting Islam, because a normal person, they would have killed him immediately. But the difference was, Al Yamama at the time was the, one of the most fertile places in Arabia. And it was through the trade going on with the center of Arabia that Mecca actually survived. Mecca up until today is a very hot place. It's a very dry place, only because of technology now that you see some green. But if you knew what Mecca was like before, nothing green, a few palm trees here and there, but the major supplies that come into Mecca are coming from the outside. It is the Zamzam water that's keeping them alive. But they were dependent upon Al Yamama for their trade. And so Thumama then, wanting to do something for Islam, recognizing what the Quraysh had done, seeing the oppression that they had carried out, the slaughter of the people, having heard the stories of the, the surrounding of Medina, first the torture in Mecca that the companions went through, and then the Battle of Bedr, the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of the Khandak, of the Trench, all of these battles, the near extermination of the people, the, the, the continuous oppression that was going on, he then said, I pledged not only myself, I pledge my life, I pledge my people to Islam. And so he returned to the area, having been the first person to make the talbiya, the labayk, Allahumma labayk. This is the first Muslim making it. Remember, this is before the great Umrah of the Prophet Sallallahu This is before it. So th this is a record in the sense. Uh, today, people will put you in the Guinness uh, uh, Book of Records. This is the first person to make the talbiya. A great achievement. That was not enough for him. He wanted to solidify what he was doing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wanted to pay back for the lives he had taken and for the bad thoughts and intentions that he had. And so he returned to the center of Arabia and he cut off all supplies. He cut off the trade with Mecca. And this is what you would call today muqata. It is a boycott. He literally cut the trade. And as the year went by, the difficulty came in on Quraysh like a thunderous bolt. They were suffering because their goods are coming from there. Their sustenance is coming from there. Their animals could not be fed. The wheat, the major wheat production in Arabia at that time was in the center of Arabia. So their bread is cut off. Much of their supplies, even the sukkari dates that you get today, this is where it comes from. The best dates in Arabia are coming from out of the center as well. And so it was all cut off and they really began to suffer to the point where starvation started to come in. And the Quraysh out of desperation sent a delegation to the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him. And they said, in words with Abu Sufyan came as their leader, the same person who had sought revenge in Uhud, the same person who had organized against them with the Ahzab in the Battle of the Trench. 
He came now as a beggar because of the sanctions that were put upon his city. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, I thought you were a mercy to all of humanity. We had a treaty, this uh, Sulah, Hudaybiyah. We have a treaty of Hudaybiyah that I made, we made with you, that we would have brotherhood uh, between ourselves. I thought we had some kind of agreement uh, that, that that was actually going on. And the Prophet selling be, being a mercy for all of humanity, he then um, sent a letter to the mama and told him, lift the boycott, allow the trade to go through. Because it is not the intention of Islam, not the intention of Muslims, uh, that we are harming the individuals, but we are calling to the good and forbidding evil, not the innocent people to suffer. And so Tumama then lifted the boycott. Following this in the same area, one of the lowly people who was demented, deluded individual, Musaylima, then came up and said, I am the messenger of God. He got a little attention from the Prophet ﷺ when his delegation went to Medina. But he was not really the leader. Tumama was the leader. And so Musaylima then came up and claimed to be the messenger of Allah. And he sent a letter to the Prophet ﷺ saying, from Musaylima, Rasulullah, to Muhammad, Rasulullah. You take half of Arabia, and I'll take the other half. So the Prophet ﷺ wrote back to him and said, from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, to Musaylima, al kadhab the liar. And he quoted from the Quran, Inna al-arda lillahi yuri tuha min yasha'u min ibadi wal aqibatul al-muttaqin. Surely this earth belongs to Allah, and He gives it to whom He pleases, from His servants and worshippers. And the best reward is for those who have piety and right action. And immediately the Muslims recognized the danger of these people. The Prophet ﷺ had passed away. But it was in the time of Umar ibn Khattab that, and even before that, that uh, Dumama himself announced his Islam and he began to wage a struggle against Musaylima. This was the first activities, the first struggle against the liar prophet. It was done by Thumama himself. Following this, the armies of Islam led by Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anh, came to the area, they followed up Tumama's actions and they defeated Musaylima and finished his false prophethood. But Tumama himself would go down as one of the great leaders who had embraced Islam. And we have to remember that although the Prophet ﷺ himself did not declare the boycott, he allowed it to happen. He did not um, punished Tumama. He did not say to him, what you did is wrong. It's against the Sunnah. He told him, because seeing the effect on the Quraysh, lift it. And so it was lifted. And some historians even look to the fact that by the time the Prophet ﷺ and his companions then opened up Mecca, the Fatu Mecca, this is one of the physical reasons why the Quraysh could not resist because they had been weakened by the boycott and the sanctions that went on. And so in looking at this illumination and what is happening in the world today, we recognize that Muslims are being pressurized and attacked by a number of nations. Recently, uh, because of a very sad situation in France where a Muslim immigrant uh, from Chechnya, who's not part of the French community, Muslim community, was angry because a teacher then uh, put up cartoons against the Prophet ﷺ. He, he, he took it in his own hands as a vigilante and he murdered that teacher. I want to make it very clear that we do not condone any type of vigilante action like this. This would be considered a crime in the Muslim lands. But we do recognize that the response of the French 
by closing down masjids, by demonizing Islam, by allowing the right wing people within that country to start attacking Muslims and women have been attacked. Two women were stabbed under the Eiffel Tower. People are being beaten. They're living in fear. This is not the response that is supposed to be because we recognize that if France is a secular society, then if something is done against any religion, if the Jewish religion is attacked, if their leaders, their leaders if Moses, peace be upon him, is uh, ridiculed in a cartoon, this would be considered anti-Semitism. If women are being openly ridiculed, it's anti-feminism. And so the secular state does not allow these things to be happening to uh, religion. And so when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is, is attacked, and it is clear that it hurts the sensibilities of Muslims as he is the messenger of Allah and his sunnah, his way, is a major part of our understanding. It is well known, it is well discussed, and so it is an open attack upon the Muslim world. And this follows the centuries going back to the Crusades, when even the first crusade was called in Clermont, which is in France, where the first major crusaders to come were the Franks, where the Western side, when crusades were sent against the Muslims in Spain and Portugal and Andalus, it was the Franks. And so it is part of an ongoing animosity and attack against Islam. And so Muslims, we are not those who take revenge, wild revenge. However, we do have the right to resist. And in the Sunnah or the way of Dumama, if we're not, if we feel this pressure happen, we see the evil that is going on, we have a, a right to resist. In Dumama's case, he did not sell goods. He, he stopped that. But in our case, we, we do not have to buy goods because we are some of the biggest consumers in the world. Even in tourism, Islamic tourism considered to be the biggest tourism in the world now in terms of cosmetics, in terms of uh, uh, quality products, high-end clothing, much of which comes out of France. Muslims are some of the biggest consumers in the world. And the least we can do with our love of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and our recognition of Islamophobia coming through all ranks within that society, the least we can do is stop eating their products and stop wasting our money upon goods which only have a name on the back of it, but are not even as, 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 as well done as products coming from our own lands. And so the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him and the people around him give us the best example and they give us illumination. They give us light at the end of this darkness, that at the end of the tunnel, there is light through that illumination that is coming from Islam. And so, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for the Muslims in France and the Muslims throughout the world, throughout Europe, and even here in the Americas, right here in Toronto, in the GTA, Islamophobia is on the rise. Our masjids are under attack. People have been killed. People have been threatened. Islamophobia is rising up. But we are not going to sit back idly. We're not going to roll over and die as they say, but we will stand up for the truth. We will not take the form or actions of a savage in order to fight savagery. We will keep the best character. But in the tradition of our companions, in the, in the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we will stand clearly uh, for Islam. We will stand clearly for our message. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have mercy on this ummah and would make it easy for all those who are suffering throughout the Muslim world as I leave you with these thoughts.
and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.